Welcome back to the Homestand Show. Joining us now is Mo Dakil of Los Angeles, California. He's a writer, a podcaster, all over Bleacher Report and the Athletic NBA. Thank you so much, Mo, for waking up at 8 o'clock in the morning, your time, and taking the time to talk to us, lowly yes. Northern Forks folks over here. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes you got to let the, the the east side and the north know who you are by and, and that requires sacrifices like waking up early and setting an alarm. Absolutely. You know how I'm jealous I am of the West Coast time zone. You guys get to watch these games. Yeah. I'm like hanging out in dear life at one o'clock in the morning to watch the LA showdown. I, I, I don't know about that. Okay, See, Justin, maybe you might be different. I'm I'm from the West Coast. So I'm from Vancouver, so. I think that the East Coast kind of has it. It's a, you have to give and take a little bit, right? They ask you to stay late oh. for the West Coast games, but NFL time, one o'clock, that's nothing beats that. <laughs> Justin, Justin, you couldn't be more wrong than, than <laughs> that. <laughs> First off, let me just explain to you anything, something. West Coast time, NFL, 10 a.m. Yeah, but Perfect. you have to go out late on the Saturday night. You want to need, need a couple you need a couple hours to Perfect. recuperate. <laughs> but even then, even then, you wake up, you're slowly groggy. You're kind of just rolling in. It's it's a slow morning. You turn on the NFL games. You're good to go. The okay. West Coast time zone is the best time zone for American sports, period. You have the best everything over there. They got the best time zone, the best weather, the best mm -hmm. landscape. And they also have Mo. Mo knows everything NBA. He follows everything closely. So who better to pick the brain of this fine Thursday morning. Sorry, I forgot the day of the week for a second. This fine Thursday morning, then Mo DeKeel. So Mo, I got to ask you first and foremost, we know how closely you pay attention to the NBA. So what's a team out there in this parody year that's disappointed you and you thought would be doing better than they are right now? I think the most obvious question or answer to that question is the Dallas Mavericks. You see what they're doing. They have Luka, who was basically an MVP candidate to start the season and has full on falling apart at this point with the trade deadline bringing in Kyrie but even before then their defense was terrible they really were struggling across the board and then since they brought Kyrie in and they gave up Dorian Finney-Smith one of their best defenders everything has fallen apart for this team and now we're looking at the possibility that they're not even going to make the play-in tournament forget the playoffs just making the play-in tournament and it doesn't even seem likely so it's it's pretty there it's hands down they're the most disappointing team now Mark Cuban came out and made some uh, very interesting comments about Jalen Brunson and the whole contract situation, how his father got involved and all of that. It's very noisy in Dallas right now. And I feel like they're now put in a position where they're going to have to re-sign Kyrie to salvage this situation. Is there a chance Luka Doncic could just get fed up and request a trade out of Dallas? I mean, Justin, it's the NBA. It's going to happen at some point. Somebody's going to do it, you know, <laughs> in, in terms of a, a star. There's one almost every year. Possibly could be Luka. I don't think it's going to be Luka this season. I think he's going to wait to see how the offseason goes. But the Mavs have to make some smart moves. And to Mark Cuban's, you know, argument about the whole Jalen Brunson side of it. Yeah, but you went and signed JaVale McGee three years. Like, you really don't have a leg to stand on when it comes to deals that you've made and, and whatnot. I feel like they've made some massive mistakes even long before Brunson and bringing in Christian Wood, JaVale McGee, like pieces that don't really help them defensively, even though the idea of bringing McGee Wood, but signing him for three years was just a massive mistake. I feel like they've really put themselves in a very difficult position. So it shouldn't shock anybody if Luka does come out in the offseason and demands a trade. If you were to dole with the blame, like the blame pie, of the Dallas Mavericks. Who do you think shoulders the most blame? Is it Mark Cuban in the front office? Is it Jason Kidd? Is it Luca? Is it Kyrie? Who gets the most blame for a team that destroyed the Phoenix Suns, a historically good regular season team, to go to the Western Conference Finals? And now they're fighting for their play-in lives. I think to start out, and this will surprise everybody, I think Kyrie gets zero blame. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of these problems that. were there before he got there. I think Mark Cuban and the front office really do hold the brunt of this and a large amount of it. I don't think Jason Kidd is a particularly good coach. I think he's a bit of a liability for them. And then I think Luka Doncic has to own the fact that he's just terrible defensively, doesn't give a lot of effort, complains a lot to the referees and allows the other teams to get into transition. A lot of those types of things. I think that – those three parties are all involved in terms of they share the blame. And Kyrie, to his, you know, just to be fair, this has nothing to do with him. These problems were bad before he got there. 
And they brought him in and they made a big swing to get him. And I don't think there's much that he could improve in that situation. I was scared when I asked you the question, you might say the Toronto Raptors. I disappointed you the most this season. Because <laughs> there's a couple teams out there, you know. There's You could go with the Minnesota route, the yeah. Toronto route, the Dallas route. But for sure, Dallas, I think, based off where they were last year to now, has just been a slap in the face for that fan base. But let's stick, stick to, the, to the, uh, the actual funny, the best part of it, the, the good part of it. What's the team that's impressed you instead? Yeah, I think we got to go with the Sacramento Kings. <laughs> like the I beam. think they're the... The, this this is easy questions, guys. This is the most obvious one, right? <laughs> Who had them finishing third in the Western Conference, winning the Pacific Division at the start of the season? I certainly did not. And I think you just look at the way they played. Their offense has been unbelievable. I mean, it's that it, just the way they play offensively is absolutely amazing. I think DeMontis Sabonis and De'Aaron Fox are going to be all NBA guys. When was the last time we talked about one King as a potential all NBA guy? And I'm saying these two guys should be locks. For all NBA, that's just a wild change. Mark, uh, excuse me, Mike Brown, uh, coach of the year. Mark Brown does not need to be coach of the year. I don't know who that is. Um, <laughs> but Mike Brown, coach of the year, I think is pretty obvious. And that breaking the playoff drought, there's no other team than them, I think, being the most, you know, uh, uh, surprising in that. We have contenders. Oklahoma City is definitely one of them. I think there's, you know, the Cleveland Cavaliers really kind of, I think, surpassed some expectations by finishing fourth in the Eastern Conference. But at the end, it's the Kings. Now, heading into the playoffs, I think a lot of the dialogue amongst you know the Western Conference is that everybody kind of wants that sixth spot to take on the Kings. Are, M are rival NBA teams taking this team for granted because they have the best offense in basketball? Yeah, I don't think they are because even though they have the best offense in basketball, they do have a terrible defense. They do. And they do. That's yes. an important <laughs> aspect there in that end. And I think, you know, it's as explosive as their offense is, they give up a ton defensively in those situations. And in the playoffs, it's going to come down to defense. We know the old adage defense wins championships. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what teams are banking on is that. If we have an entire week to prepare for them, whoever gets the sixth seed is going to have four or five days before the first playoff game. They're going to be able to sit down and start to kind of put together a defensive scheme to take advantage of the Kings and try to put them in bad positions. We'll see how they react to it. A lot of these guys for Sacramento have never been in the playoffs. So I think this is going to be an interesting sort of like almost like a, an awakening for them of like, mm -hmm. oh, this is what playoff basketball is like. It's completely different than the regular season, and I think the Kings will find out. So, you know, I, I'm not surprised teams are targeting them because that's when your options are Denver, Memphis, Sacramento, or Phoenix, and Phoenix with Kevin Durant, you're going to go like, yeah, no, I'm going to take Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm taking it you're not taking the Sacramento Kings out the West of the Conference this year, eh? No, no, They're no. not making it out, no. <laughs> so... Let's let's fast forward a little bit. We're about to see the NBA playoffs take place and obviously the NBA finals will be happening in June of this year. Who is your early pick to make it out of both conferences? Well, I think the Milwaukee Bucks are the, my favorites in the East. I, it's between them and Boston, but I think Milwaukee will get the edge. Just I think they have a lot more hunger behind it than I think the Celtics. I think the Celtics have still some issues to figure out offensively and, and rotation wise and things like that. I think Milwaukee knows exactly who they are. Everybody knows their role. They're perfectly set. The West is like, just, you know, close your eyes and throw, you know, uh, <laughs> a, a dart at the board and, and whoever it lands on is this, this can go so many different ways. If I had to pick right now, and it, it probably will drive some people nuts. I'm probably going the Phoenix suns. And, you know, I know all of the problems that they have, but, I don't think people realize that Kevin Durant hasn't lost a game in what feels like three or four months in a game that he's played. It's been wild. I think he's 23 and two in his last 25 games, including Brooklyn and Phoenix. I mean, at a certain point, we have to kind of start realizing like, hey, man, he's kind of good at basketball. And I think that's just my pick. But honestly, the West can go so many different ways. If you ask me in two hours, I might have a whole different answer. <laughs> No love for the Sixers and uh, MVP Joel Embiid. MVP. Yeah, none. None. Um, no, no, none. No. <laughs> you don't. And he. And, and I think he is the MVP, but I still don't trust him in the playoffs. Okay. You know okay. when you look at the fact that it took basically a MVP like performance to beat the Boston Celtics at home recently, when the Celtics didn't even have Jalen Brown out there, it really said a lot to me, and I think that was a very interesting note for me on that end and i think you know how how comfortable justin do you feel in trusting james harden in the playoffs 
see, that's where I think this year, there's just something, every great player gets over that hump at one point in time in their career. And I think this is Joel Embiid's year. He's going to win MVP. It should have been his back-to-back MVP year this year. I think he gets over the hump. And I think they beat Boston in the playoffs. But, well, and Justin, I'm kind of looking at Doc Rivers over here. I need to see some adjustment from the the, the playoff king who never seems to make it over the hump. I think the South, the, you know, if you look at Philly, if you look at Clippers, mm-hmm. their demise might have been the guy who's been coaching that team. Yeah, I mean, they all have playoff ghosts and all of that stuff. You know, Noor, you're 100% right. I mean, no coach has given up more 3 1 series leads than Doc Rivers. Yeah. That's pretty <laughs> impressive. Like not in a good way, but impressive hey. nonetheless. And then we we know the story with James Harden. Joel Embiid always has some freak accident. It's not even like you can't even say injured. It's just freak accidents. Last year he catches an elbow in a game that he shouldn't have been playing in at all in Toronto because it was a blowout, and that hurts them when they go play Miami. I think when you look at just kind of the roster construction, the one thing Philly doesn't have is who are they going to play as the backup five. We saw it. A few years ago, when they lost to Toronto, when Toronto won the championship, every time Embiid stepped off the court, the swing was massive. And the question is, can Paul Reed be, are you going to depend on Paul Reed for eight minutes in the playoffs? Like those eight minutes can really kill you. And I think that's going to be the important question for the Sixers to have to answer. And I don't know if they have that on their bench right now. Well, thank you so much again, Moda Keel of Bleacher Report and the Athletic NBA for joining us today. We're going to have to bring you back in a couple of weeks to see how your predictions play out. And if anything, we're going to have to make you do some dares on screen if uh, nothing really comes to them out. But thanks again so much, Mo. Stick around for Jovan Buha up next to talk everything LeBron and the L.A. Lakers.